Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are hopefully here for Creative uh, Comics Talk. Uh, in partnership with Image Comics for New York Comic Con. I am here today with Tabrija Jones, my co-presenter, -pre co and we are in conversation today with Charles Soul and Ryan Brown. And we are going to hopefully have, well, not hopefully, we will have a great discussion about comics creating um, their process, their work. Um, and we will have time for questions that you can enter in the chat. Apologies in advance for any background noise on my end I am in the office today um so with that Tavija you can go to the next slide so again we are your moderators my name is Whitney Davidson Rhodes I am an associate manager for young adult programs and services at the New York Public Library we focus on teens and I have the pleasure again of being in partnership with Tabrisha Jones young adult librarian at the Pelham Park Way Van Ness branch. And our part, our third partner in crime, Joe, couldn't be with us today, but he's been helping us with our other author talks that we had uh, with Image. Next slide. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, just keep yourself muted if you're not speaking. It'll prevent a lot of ambient noise. Also, we are recording, so uh, you're, you don't want your voice captured if you don't right. want it to be. Uh, so this is Zoom. Uh, we are in Zoom, hopefully in this virtual landscape, people are familiar, but we have the mute and unmute uh, feature. You can be on cam if you choose to. Um, if you have to leave early, no need to let us know. You can just click that leave button. If for whatever reason you are having trouble following along with what we're saying, uh, you can click that CC for a live uh, closed captioning. And as always, please enter your questions and comments in the chat. Tabrija and I both will be monitoring them. Next slide. Um, so for the past two years, the library has said goodbye to fines, uh, so you won't get charged for any late fees. You will get charged if you don't return the item. I am guilty of that. I currently have fees myself. Um, but the library, you can check out physical and digital copies and uh, digital books as well, or e-books e and e-audiobooks through Simply E, uh, the gray E there, cloud library pretty self-explanatory, and Libby, which is the little girl in the circle. Um, so you can have access to all of these. You can also register for a library card through the Simply E app if you don't feel comfortable going in person to do so. But you are limited to accessing only digital content that way. Next slide. So... Band Books Week was last week, so we will be asking Charles and Ryan a couple questions about Band Books, uh, but this is a years-long or a year-long initiative by NYPL about getting everyone access to Freedom to Read. Uh, we kicked off last week with a book talk with uh, Mark Oshiro, who wrote Anger is a Gift, and we will be in February speaking with Ryan Reynolds, so definitely stay tuned for that. But the library, the New York Public Library especially, is all about access and giving everyone the freedom to read, and this is followed by a national campaign and a writing contest for teens. Next slide. So here are just some upcoming author events uh, that Tabrija and I are putting on. Uh, Tabrija entered them in the chat. So feel free to register. We have a couple next week. So uh, we hope you hope to see you there for those as well. And these are all virtual, um, except for one in person. Uh, but yeah, hope to see you there. Next slide. So without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to Tabrija, who's going to do an intro and get us started with some questions. Thank you, everyone, for coming and hope you enjoy this conversation. Thank you, Whitney. And I think you meant to say Jason Reynolds, not Ryan Reynolds. Oh, Let my bad. Clear. <laughs> Not yeah. Ryan Reynolds. Everybody it's knows. not the actor. It's the author. The, <laughs> geez, thank you. I was wondering why you were laughing. Sorry. This is being filmed forever and it's fine. Jason Reynolds. 
despite that, thank you, Whitney, for getting us started. Hello again. My name is Sabrisha Jones, and I am the Young Adult Librarian at the Pelham Parkway Van Ness Branch. And I have the ex extreme pleasure of introducing our special guest today, creative comic um, duo, um, writer and artist, Charles Soule and Ryan Brown. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. I was about to say this afternoon, but it is the morning. So thank you so much. Of course. It, yeah. is, it is amazing to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Wow, you're welcome. So I want to give um, a bio of, for our two special guests. So Charles Soule is the New York Times bestselling Brooklyn-based comic book writer, musician, and attorney. He is best known for writing Daredevil, She-Hulk, Death of Wolverine, inspiration for the film Logan, and various Star Wars comics from Marvel Comics, as well as his creator-owned series, Curse Words from Image Comics, and the award-winning political sci-fi epic Letter 44 from Ani Press. He also had a debut novel, The Oracle Gear, which was published in 2018 by HarperCollins. And then we have Ryan Brown, who created God Hates Astronauts, among other series and a story of superheroes, NASA, farmers, and more jokes per page than any other comic in history, probably. <laughs> so again, thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon, I, this morning. Oh my God, it is really so early. <laughs> so we want to get started. Um, so both of you have an, had a new book that came out, um, and I should know this at the top of my head, and I do not. This is bad. It's called Eight, Eight Billion, billion genies. genies. There you go. <laughs> Eight Billion Genies. Mm -hmm. So if you both can give a brief synopsis of the book, and also can you um, give us like why, what inspired you to write this book? Because when I read the synopsis, I was like, this is like really out there. And so like the appeal was just really grabbing. So I, did, we definitely want to ask like what came, um, what um, gave you guys the idea to write this? What if, what if I give the synopsis and then you give the inspiration, Ryan, right? since that's actually kind of how it worked, right? Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. So, so the synopsis of the book is, is, exactly what it says on, on the cover, eight billion genies. Everybody on earth gets a genie uh, at exactly the same moment. But the thing that makes this story different from other genie stories you've heard like Aladdin or whatever is that in this story, everybody, everybody only gets one wish. So what you have is a world in which everybody at the same moment can have exactly what they have always wanted. They can have their heart's desire or whatever crazy impulse pops into their head. Um, but everybody else is also getting that at the same time. And so that generates this world that has a lot of extremely wild things happening uh, all at once. And so in the book, we, we kind of carve out a path where you can, you can see a way that you could almost survive in this world. And so we, we look at the way the world changes over the first eight minutes from when the genies appear, then the first eight hours, the first eight days, the first eight weeks, and so on, all the way through the first 800 years after these genies pop up on Earth. And it is um, a really fun story. It came out in a beautiful collected edition this, uh, this summer. We're both really proud of it. It did really well. And people seem to really connect with the idea of, of um, literal wish fulfillment for everybody on earth. So that's, that's what the book's about. Um, why did we, why did we write this crazy book, Ryan? Why did we decide to uh, do this? Well, <clears throat> it was an idea I had a long time ago. Um, that was just a, a throwaway hypothetical of what would happen if everybody got a genie that granted them a wish all at the same time. And it existed in this world where it was a really fun conversation piece like when you're out having drinks or whatever or you're hanging out at a comic show with other creators and so um it was just like a throwaway idea i put I, pro I proposed to charles at one comic show and then he never really let it go because he thought there was something there so it was a long time ago too um i think it was originally called seven billion genies uh, mm -hmm. and and it was it's just a fun hypothetical to be like well what would you wish for but what would everybody else be wishing for? And then what would happen to our world? And what kind of world would you be wishing into? And then what would happen to celebrities? Would everybody wish to be the celebrities or be married to the celebrities? Or, you know, 
once everybody has a billion dollars, then money is worthless, right? So like, it's a fun hypothetical. You can just roll and roll and roll and roll. And uh, thankfully, Charles never let it go because I thought it's not really a story because in the first, you know, minute, someone wishes for the world to blow up and then the book's over, right? So we had to figure out some sort of structure that would limit things or focus things so that you could tell a story within the framework of this world where everybody has a wish. And, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, The Walking Dead tells human stories in a framework of zombies everywhere. It's that, it's that kind of... Um, uh, vibe but it it's it's fun because what you wish for says so much about who you are as a person like the you have one wish the one thing you want and if you wish if you wish to be the most famous person in the world or you wish to have a loved one back from the dead or if you wish for everyone to be happy like it says so much about who you are and so having that as a story device to like um tell really personal stories within like a greater framework of utter chaos Mm -hmm. of of wishes and 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 crazy stuff flying all around um is is really really fun and and thankfully charles uh didn't uh let me say no to it and so we we charles <laughs> figured it out charles is charles is the structure guy um i'm i'm the i'm the guy that draws the weird monsters in the background yeah it 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 was it was a perfect idea for a comic book especially a comic book being drawn by ryan because there's 8 billion wishes and you have to think that some people are going to wish for some very out there things just statistically, right? Somebody is going to wish that they're going to be a unicorn. So, so all of a sudden it, it's completely valid to have a unicorn in the background of a panel or front and center in a panel. Uh, we, we had this recurring theme in the comic about people who wish to be turned into giant Godzilla sized ears of corn for some reason. And while that doesn't make any sense, it doesn't have to, because in a world where everybody gets a wish, almost everything's going to happen at least once. Um, so, so we get to have the, the wild visuals that really make the comic medium pop, but we also get to do something that's deeply relatable because you know all, everybody on this call, everybody who's listening to this call, you guys, everybody here, everybody is right now they're thinking, well, what would I wish for in this scenario? And that's what makes the book sort of something everybody can connect to and read, which is, which is what people keep coming up and talking to us about when we do appearances or you know, do shows or online or whatever. Um, it's always about, how people find themselves in this really out there premise, which is kind of what you always want to do when you're making creative work. So we can't just move on from the conversation without me asking, what would you two wish for? If you had your own personal genie, <laughs> what would mm -hmm. you wish for? <laughs> well, you know, it, again like the 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 equation changes when everybody has a genie right um because uh part of the fun of exploring this book was realizing like oh it's very dangerous um <laughs> and so i i thought about it a lot and what i would do is you know you see throughout the book that people start kind of banding together and and making these kind of wish proof havens um and like you basically need to use your wish to protect yourself within this world. And so if I, if I were in this world and everybody had a wish, I would work with friends and family and use our wishes communally. You know, something that the first wish would be to protect, uh, you know, this group from all outside wishes. And then, you know, like I would like to live for as long as I wanted to, you know, I think that that's a, like as a 25 year old, that's the thing that I'd wish for. And then when I was when I was ready to not be alive anymore, I could just say goodbye. That's what that would be my wish. <laughs> um, well, fortunately, I happen to be very good friends with a fellow who would use his wish to to get like safety going on, so that I would have a nice safe place to go and I wouldn't have to worry about protecting yeah, myself. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd use mine to protect you, Charles. I know you would. I need I someone to write I'd... books for me. All, all I all I would would hope is that you would open the door to to me and my family to come in and join you in your your wish haven. Um, but so so with that squared away, I don't know. I'd probably wish to be like a Jedi or something cool like that. I am I, I do a lot of work in Star Wars and uh, I, I'm I'm very familiar with the whole Jedi Knight thing and that sounds like it would not just be awesome but also very useful in this in this wish world. So Ryan would feel even better about letting me in if I was a real Jedi because I could help with that whole scene. Yeah, I'd make I'd make you like get things for me, you know. Yeah, use like the float floor, them across the room. The couch. 
you go, you know, use the force to get me a beer or whatever, or a, a snack. Well, I don't think Yoda would approve, but, you know, circumstances would be pretty dire. So I, I guess I do what I had to do. Okay. All right. You mean a servant, Ryan? Like, yeah, well, look, a I'm Jedi servant. him and his family. I, I you know, <laughs> and he doesn't have to get up. He can just like do this and then it flies into the room. I, I guess that's true. It seems like a waste of the noble art of the Jedi, but okay, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. <laughs> but you can you can protect our house with a lightsaber if you want. That's you what I really want to do. I want to fight the the cor giant corn men with a lightsaber. <laughs> anyway, we are getting slightly off topic. No, um, <laughs> no, I think that's perfect. I for me, I wouldn't be. I'm like never having to worry about money, never having to go mm -hmm. in debt. Just swipe a credit card, and it's girl girl math, and it's. Like yep. free money basically yeah oh i don't know what i would wish for um probably a library of my own because uh. i have so many books as whitney had earlier pointed out <laughs> when we joined this call so i would probably wish for like an additional room so i can hold my books i know what? it's like very a magical what? library, basically. Yeah, with, with like a ladder with those those things. Yeah, with the ladders, of course. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, we're libraries. going. I'm we're changing going my wish. I want that too. <laughs> yeah, that is what. Mm -hmm. like yeah, the we're going with, Yeah, and you're going with the stairs. You're gonna. I'm gonna. Be oh, back, the stairs like a balcony. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm going. It's giving that. Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what would be great too is if it's not just books that um I've read and loved, but also books I haven't read yet. Exactly. So it's so it's a combination. Oh man, yeah. I'm not sorry, Ryan. I I'm gonna bring all my books with me now. I'm not gonna be a judge. Anymore. I was gonna say, didn't did did you did you guys not watch the Twilight Zone? You know you're gonna trip and break oh, your glasses, glasses immediately. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We won't be able to read. Well, I don't we'll, know. We'll, it's still we'll, a good wish. We'll we'll get to that obstacle, Ryan. When it happens. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're in a communal thing, then someone can at least read to you. True, true. And also, right, I am nearsighted. So if I have the book up close, I can read it. There so... you go. Okay. All right. You've thought of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so can we both come to your place with both of our libraries, Ryan? So you have two libraries? Yeah, sure. That's fine. I'm going to break my glasses immediately. I just know it. So <laughs> I can feel and the freedom. Yeah, Charles, you will definitely need to be there because with your Jedi powers, I need someone to get like the beer. Oh, from the, the high print. shelves. Yes. Yeah, the shelves. Yes. Absolutely. I could just jump. <laughs> Absolutely. So this I conversation is exactly why this idea stayed alive between right. us is that you can just talk about it forever yep. and you can like game it out in so many different ways and you'll see in the book there are in the first you know eight minutes is total chaos because so many people impulsively use their wish because they're like oh i know exactly what i would do and then the people that sit on them and wait on them and think them through and then realize that the world is changing and they have to you know wish for the world that they're in now that creates a lot of interesting dynamics and like uh, uh you know narratives with all these different characters that have to you have to hold on to your wish eventually you realize because without it you are completely exposed to everyone else but anyways it's it's like the ultimate hypothetical and uh like charles and i could remake this book you know eight billion times and take it in a different direction every single time you know follow all these different people and different wishes mm -hmm. so it seems like both of you have such a great relationship and you because you've collaborated on not only this comic book but also on other works mm -hmm. and it's and it's kind of really rare to see that like how you guys are able to like two people to come together and they just like you you seem to be in sync like you know what each of you are looking for and i i we definitely wanted to ask this question like what inspired both of you individually as um to become like comic book creators and illustrators and then also what um what made you guys come together to collaborate on on the the works that you um that you are looking to publish or have you, you have previously published do you want to do you want to start Ryan? i mean this is no, a great you question you're good you're good okay okay you love to talk go 
<laughs> I do love to talk. I love it. Um, so so I I got into comics initially uh, because I went to law school a long time ago, and I knew like I walked out of the bar exam after graduating from law school, and I was like I. I think I passed the bar, but I have made a terrible mistake. Uh, I knew right away that I was I was going down a path that while, I mean, come on, it's a great career. It's awesome. Like, it, there's, there's no problem with being a lawyer. I, I did it for a long time, but I knew what I really wanted to do was to tell stories. I always had wanted to tell stories. And so... That that day, I, I basically went and bought a like a, a notebook at the at the stationery store and started writing my first novel in longhand. And so for like five or six years, I was working on, on writing novels, and it it's a really long, arduous process. I have now written a number of novels, and so I it it never gets any easier. If anything, it gets harder, even as you become more skilled. But the in the early days of me doing that like it's very very difficult to get your first novel published and, and like make the connections you need to make and so on so i got a little exhausted from it after five years or so and so i started looking into the idea of making comics because comics number one aren't as solitary as writing a novel because you're working with an artist and you're you're working with you know a, a team of people it's like you're in a band which is something else i've always i've always done is music stuff so it was, it was more like it was a joint effort uh i didn't have to have all the weight of everything on my own shoulders. Uh, and I've always loved comics since I was really little. So I started figuring out the way the comics industry worked, who, you know, how you go from zero to writing Daredevil one day. Uh, and it turns out it's a really long, complicated path. I think of it in my head as a ladder when you just keep climbing and climbing and, and you don't worry so much about the top rung, you worry about the next rung above you and you just focus on getting there. And eventually you find yourself at the top or, you know, higher. Uh, so I started climbing that ladder around 2005 and I didn't have my first comic published in any real way until 2009. And then I didn't have my first like big comic published in 2000 until 2013. So it was like a, you know, like a 13 year journey from, from starting to, I'm going to saying, I'm going to be a writer instead of a lawyer, uh, until actually really kind of being able to feel that that was true. Um, and, and from the day I started to write comics, it was about nine years until I was, I was published in a big way. Uh, so it took a long, long time. And, and the, the real trick to it was the trick that I think is true of any creative career or any difficult to achieve goal is just you start and you, you, you think about the next step ahead of you more than you think about the end goal and you never stop moving. And, and it, it was hard and it took forever. And I was, I was, had to be a lawyer at the same time. Uh, which meant, again, that's not bad, but it meant that I just, I had a really, really, really intense workload for a really, really, really long time. Uh, but eventually I got to, I got to where I wanted to be and, and was able to shift out of law. I still am a lawyer, but I'm not practicing and I, I write full time now. So it, it was very joyful for me. It was exactly, it, it felt like I had set a goal and given myself a dream to achieve. And then it, it, it happened, which is not, something everybody gets to say. So I feel very, very uh, lucky for that. Um, as far as Ryan and me, in those early days of comics, so so the way that I started climbing the ladder was by networking at, at comic conventions with my very like, you know, 100 copies of, of a book that I self-published, like a little comic that I would bring to a show and try to get people interested in hand it out, give it to people, whatever. Um, there were other people who were trying to do basically the same thing at the same time. And Ryan was one of them. And so we met within that sort of circle of, of strivers of, of aspiring comics creators. And we clicked almost immediately in terms of our, I don't know, I thought his sense of humor in his comics in God Hates, Ast God Hates Astronauts in particular was just, was really, really true and real. It, it was, it made me laugh very, very hard. Um, and humor in comics is really difficult to pull off because comics are like, I don't know, they're like a static medium in, in some ways, even though they, they imply motion. It's just, it's, it's hard to have jokes land in the same way, I think. And Ryan's comics are always, always, always funny and weird and great and unique. And, and so I think I, I really connected with his voice first. And then we just started, you know, like the nice thing about comics is people are generally pretty accessible. And so you can talk to them and, and meet them and, and become friendly with them, especially when they're not uh, too high above you on the ladder. Um, 
so we started becoming friendly and we would hang out at shows and tell each other jokes and make each other laugh. And, and eventually that, that turned into, Hey, you know, it probably would be really fun to make a book together. And so I'm going to let Ryan take over here. Um, but that's, that's basically my origin story in comics. All right. Okay. I can, I can do my origin story leading into our origin story. Just like mm-hmm. that. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I don't read well and I never have. Um, and so comics to me were, um, a way of like processing stories and like getting a, like absorbed in stories, um, because they would, they would hold my attention a lot better than, than reading novels or, um, you know, anything else that I had to read in school. So, uh, I used to always mess around with like comic style drawings. Um, but eventually I went to art school and wanted to be a, like a painter, like a fine artist. Um, because, um, at least at that time, pretty much every art teacher I ever had told me not to be drawing comics because they were you know lowbrow and not art kind of thing like I don't I didn't have a single teacher all the way through high school that um you know said anything positive about me drawing you know Batman's head exploding or you know whatever strange goat person or whatever weird thing I was drawing um <clears throat> so it wasn't until I was in college that um we uh you know I went to a school that uh one of my favorite comic artists, David Mazzucchelli, uh taught mm-hmm. at, and he, uh, I, I took a course with him, and then I ended up taking an independent study with him, and his entire course was about storytelling. It wasn't um, about uh, craftsmanship of drawing at all. It was about uh, how to tell a story and like the mechanisms of that. And so, you know, like it was, you can tell a, a very emotional story with like a circle talking to a square. Right. Like if you do it, if you use the tricks of comics well enough. So um, so that's when I started realizing that that was what I was the most interested in was, uh, you know, cr- constructing a narrative and making people laugh. And, um, you know, as much as I really enjoyed painting, what I would do when no one was telling me to 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 work was I would draw comic stuff. And that was like that was the vacation. So I decided to try and make the vacation the job. Um and uh, that was a mistake for about 10 years out of school. Um, <laughs> I worked a lot of retail um, and uh, I eventually got a graphic design job, which I didn't study graphic design, but I, I, you know, I messed with type design and comics and I would do like rock posters and stuff. And so I, um, it ended up being an incredibly important job for me because it, it was a, a graphic design job, but it was also a, they had their own print shop and I learned about graphic design and book production. And with that skill set, I then realized that I didn't need anyone to hire me to draw a comic for them. I could make my own. And so I started making zines. I would stay after work and I would use all of the, um, you know, like they had all these giant machines that like, uh, when you would press play on a printing job, it would have to spit out just like, I don't know, 10 yards of paper before it could start. And so they just had just stacks and stacks of paper and all these binding machines. And so um, that's when I really started realizing that, like, you know, forget trying to get some Marvel editor to hire me. I'm going to make my own comics. And so then I made my own comics. And that's when people started actually liking my comics. Mm-hmm. Um and so I kind of built a, a little bit of a cult following and went to comic shows and um, was happy if I only lost like a couple hundred dollars doing a comic show, you know, because I sold enough like zines uh, that I printed at work. And um, and eventually I started getting attention of people that that made comics and they liked what I did. And um, like through that experience, I figured out how to monetize my own stuff and how to cut out most of the, you know, the middlemen so that I could actually do this for a living. And, and so I've, I've since really stuck to those principles, which is mm-hmm. why I basically only work with image comics because you own uh, the book that you make. Um, whereas when, you know, I was in college, I just wanted to draw a daredevil and Batman and like work for Marvel and DC. But then it, like, as I got older, I realized that you, you give up so much control and, you know, you're making art for someone else to own. And so, um, so then I, I, you know, as a career, I just really wanted to make things that I would own and like had full control over. And it, 
it, it led to, you know, eventually getting in at Image Comics and they published some God Hayes Astronaut stuff that I had made. Um, some of the stuff that I self-published, they reprinted. Um, and then, you know, and then meeting Charles and having such similar sensibilities, um, you know, like it's, for better it's really or for worse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a really interesting job because you spend most of your time alone, but then you have these comic shows that you go to, I don't know, five to ten a year. And you get to have FaceTime with your fans and your readers, but also all of your peers. And so that's when you can just like share war stories of, you know, the horrible editor you worked with or the deadlines that were impossible or all the time you spend, you know, working alone. And um, and so Charles and I like became really close friends and uh, I'm pretty guarded in terms of working with friends because I know it can ruin relationships. Um so we didn't actually work on anything for for many years after being good friends, um, and then that first that first main project we did we did a two page thing for uh, for Swamp Thing for DC Comics mm -hmm. Charles was writing Swamp Thing and he basically shoehorned me into getting a payday uh, working on a DC comic for two pages uh, and then and then we we came up with a book we finally wanted to come up with a book together. Um, and we came with a book together and then we put together the pitch and then we turned it in the image and they had said, we like it, but we have a book that's very similar. So we're not going to publish this. And so we shelved that. And then we started thinking again. And that's when we came up with Curse Words. And Curse Words was uh, a book we did for four years at Image Comics. And there's 28 issues. 29. Uh, 29 issues. That's right. We did a final bonus issue for the... Uh, the omnibus hardcover, which is out uh, from from Image, um, but yeah, that's when we really started working together and like um, figuring out that our sensibilities meshed really, really well. And like the the Venn diagram was like, you know, there was a pretty good chunk in the middle. But Charles's skill set over here really complemented what I'm very bad at, and then I could just put in some silliness that would kind of lighten things up a little bit, and and mm -hmm. those all meshed together really, really well. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and we do a lot of back and forth, like I don't write the scripts at all, but we talk about ideas and then Charles writes a script. It comes to me. I do a lot of inventing, you know, because basically the artist on a comic is kind of like the actors. And so the actors, you know, like I have to do the costuming and the acting and the special effects and all that aspect. And so then when it goes to Charles, then he will rewrite um dialogue and so we go back and forth and push back and forth and so it ends up being um like a true awesome collaboration whereas a lot of times when you work for like marvel or dc you turn in a script and then the artist that you don't ever really talk to turns in their art and then mm -hmm. and then maybe you get to do a lettering pass and that's it but you don't really have as much of a it's more assembly line than um than what charles and i were doing um i I want to pull out two things from what Ryan said. Uh, first is, is I think in, in what you heard us both say, one of the things that attracted us both to comics is the idea that it is a, a medium where you can, you can do it yourself. Like the, you, you can, all you need is a piece of paper and a pencil and you can make your own comic and, and nobody can really tell you, you can't, uh, you, and, and the only thing standing between you with that, piece of paper and that pencil and and wherever you really want to go is is kind of your 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 willpower and and decision to get better and and you know drive and that's something that is not necessarily the case with a lot of other creative mediums like if you want to make a movie you kind of need a bunch a bunch of money uh but one of the really great things and that's always been true with comics is that most people have access to a pencil and a piece of paper and it and it's no matter what their background is and it's uh it's a really, it's a really, really good thing. Uh, it's, you can, you can really kind of make yourself climb that ladder, which is wonderful. Um, the other thing was, was just, you know, Ryan was talking about how we bounce the ideas back and forth with each other and, and what that created over the years. I mean, we've been working together since, I don't know, a long time. I, it's probably, this is probably at least our 10 year anniversary of working together, Ryan, I think. Um, and so, so are these, there are these like motifs that, that, I mean, in jokes, really, that that are there really just to make ourselves laugh as opposed to other people. Hopefully, like it, it, it's kind of like um, 
like a long running TV show or like there's these things in the background that you like, oh, I, I remember that from four seasons ago or, or a band that keeps referencing things from earlier songs. And so we one of the things that I particularly enjoy very much that Ryan does not enjoy uh, is that uh, Ryan is a gigantic sports fan. He uh, he loves baseball in particular. I am not as much of a sports fan, but because I'm a generous collaborator, I often put baseball references and things like that into the books. Um, for example, Curse Words is littered with baseball references. But uh, since I'm not a huge sports person, I get the details wrong. Uh, like, you know, the rules of baseball, I'll mess up. Uh, the, the locations of stadiums, the, the positions on the team, I'll mess up all those things. And Ryan will correct me and he'll be like, hey, man, this isn't actually how it goes. And I'll be like, yes, but the script requires it to be this way. So, so there are all of these baseball mistakes all over our work which i know <laughs> drive ryan nuts and i shouldn't i shouldn't continue to do it but it's uh, you know it's joyful it's part of our fun dynamic right ryan yeah it's wonderful i mean i <laughs> i will say like i i am probably the only artist that likes sports uh and so i'm i'm it's it's my whole existence in comics is this weird reverse bully system where it's like all the nerds make fun of me for liking the jock thing uh and uh uh but Charles intentionally getting like my name's all over this stuff. I, I drew it like in curse words, he put what is basically Yankee stadium in Queens and people have brought that up to me being like Yankee stadiums on Queens. I'm like, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know this, Yeah, <laughs> but uh, um... I don't, I, I don't Charles, the letters are the final thing that's tweaked. So I have, I have no, there's nothing I can do. Yeah, uh, stadiums in particular are something that Ryan has repeatedly <laughs> made clear to me that he finds them difficult and frustrating to draw. It's the hardest um, thing to draw a stadium. Yeah, stadium full people. It's the hardest or, thing, or even not full in the world, right? Because it's it's seats and tiers the and all seats this stuff. and the perspective yeah. and all the, all the seats are at different angles and like it it's it's circular, but it's like a geometric chopped circular, mm -hmm. and it's uh it's the hardest thing to draw. But you and know you what is funny? Too right. <laughs> yeah, all of like it. The... It's very. It's, it's really hard. But Just somehow, trace they, it. <laughs> somehow they keep finding their way into our stores. I don't know how it happens. Somehow these stadiums keep popping up, and and I think the the nice thing is that Ryan has become known as one of the best stadium guys in the business. You want a great stadium, John? I wish it's Ryan true. Brown. That's who you call the best stadiums. <laughs> so the whole rest of your career is going to be about stadiums. What which... are you doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm giving you, a, no one will be able to draw stadiums like you forever. I'm giving you a trade, Ryan, for the rest okay. of your life. Thank You'll you. always get work. Thank you. As Tabrija and I are both in the Bronx, putting Yankee yeah. Stadium in Queens. Um, so, and when you <laughs> spoke Charles, you would have been <laughs> run out. <laughs> You can't do that. <laughs> well, I called it Northerner Stadium in the uh, in in the comic, so that gives me a little wiggle room, I suppose. But yeah, Ryan, I mean, there's all kinds of like you, ugh, many many things um, like that that we just have a we just have a great time with. And the question is whether Ryan's having a great time or I'm having a great time. Hopefully, we both are. Uh, I think it depends like thing by thing. But but what I hope I hope you guys are getting from this is that we have a very, like, it's really fun to make comics with Ryan. We have a really, really good time. It is, it is, we're doing it for ourselves and each other as much as we are for any, any hypothetical readers. But the good thing is I think the readers can sense it. And, and we, we have a rapport that is, is poured into the work. And uh, it, it, I think it comes through on every, every single page. And, and that I think is part, partly why the, our, our team up is, is successful. And we also, I think it's also successful because we all are, we both are completely driven workaholics. Oh, and that's, that's true. That's something that like you find in this industry uh, is, you know, a fun job because you get to like draw dragons and stuff. Um, but you find a lot of times people are drawn to it because that's something they like and they don't necessarily know how to um, put away all video games and actually get your work done. And so Charles and I are very good at putting away all video games and getting work done. And as a collaboration that like keeps your relationship strong and healthy so that you can mm -hmm. have more moments of joy and fun and silly than moments of, you know, you're totally like blowing our deadline and I, I hate you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, making comics is hard. 
And I, if we're, by the way, if you want to like get in here and ask us some actual questions, we're just, we, we do really enjoy talking with and to each other. And so we, we will just go the whole time. So if, if you need to ask us some questions, please let us know. But, um, but to echo what Ryan just said, making comics is really difficult. It's very detail learned. It's very challenging. And, and we also hold ourselves and each other to a very, very high standard. We want to make the best comics in the world and generally speaking do. And so it, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice to be working with somebody who feels the same way about their craft as, as I do. Like I never, it doesn't matter what the comic is or the assignment is or whatever. I always want to give it hundred percent and Ryan does too. And I think that's another reason people react positively to our stories. And I think that is like a perfect segue to ask my, well, my last question and then I'm going to pass it off to Whitney. So, and Ryan, you touched a little bit about it. It's like when you were a kid, like you were not given encouragement because, and I know when I was younger too, it it was just perceived that comics were not real books. And even in 2023, as librarians, when we try to promote like graphic novels and comics and including manga, um, we get from teachers, parents, and even other librarians, they say comics are not real books. So how can not only like educators, but just everyone who are all of, of different readers can advocate when people just don't think of comics as real books? Um, well, I, I think I think it's changed a lot since when I was a kid. I mean, the only people that discouraged me was art teachers, really. Um, and I, uh, I, I had a great, I, I had this, teacher in middle school that was an art teacher who just like flat out told me to stop drawing like robots and then I had to like paint a still life uh and um I was always so frustrated by her because she would like get mad at me for drawing comics and then uh she loved Jeopardy more than anything it was her favorite thing in the world and then when I was in college she got on Jeopardy and uh and and she did not finish with positive money so she didn't even get to play uh final Jeopardy and I found that to be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, no, I, it was it was mainly like, you know, I, I have uh, I have two nephews who are uh, 13 and 10 and they get to take like comics making classes. They've taken like comics making classes and uh, like um uh the my younger nephew max i actually had him do a drawing that's in eight billion genies um because there's uh a young boy that does a drawing of what he wants the superhero he wants to be and so i had my nephew max actually do a drawing because he likes drawing and he likes comics and so uh like i think there there's this weird um lag of understanding what comics are and when we were growing up they were still thought of as pop culture like trash and now like with dog man and and all the you know amazing spectrum of uh young adult comics i think it's like totally changed also because a lot of parents now grew up reading comics in the like same wave that i did um comics have just had like weird stigmas against them throughout like the, the course of their existence especially in america and so mm -hmm. there has been a lot of reactionary stuff that's happened and comics have gotten super violent and super adult and um you know there's a lot of blowback and fighting against them being for kids and then they go back to being for kids and like so culturally it's been very difficult to figure out what this medium is but then in other countries they usually are pretty specifically like comics are just a storytelling medium and you can get them for all different genres and ages like you know in japan and in europe like there's a lot uh better ways to you know like we're starting to understand like and i think it's been that way for like four or five years that like these are legitimate like great ways of telling stories um <clears throat> so i'm like i'm more enthused about it than i ever have been because i i do think that there is you know um I think millennials probably were didn't grab on the comics as well as they should have or some of the younger millennials. But then I feel like Gen Z has 
has really it's become more normal to them to read comics again and then even the younger generation um like the kids comics like the sales numbers on the kids comics are incredible now um mm -hmm. so i'm like super super optimistic because the line in comics was always you can't get new readers and everybody that's reading comics is a 50 year old white male and um and like that just like companies like image comics that do like more of a diverse uh range of voices and styles of books and you can get romance and horror and science fiction and all this stuff um it you know like the comics market as a whole is always very confusing but like the medium i think is doing very very well and incredible comics are being made and they're being well respected i i i echo everything ryan said as usual um but i think i think the thing the, the way that you, you get people who are resistant to comics, generally speaking, they're resistant to it because they think of them as one thing. They think of them as a particular bucket or they think that in some way it's not real reading. It's, it's not reading the way that reading prose would be. Um, and, and I think the, the, the first, the, the response to the first one is, you know, don't think of comics aren't just superheroes. Comics aren't just this or that comics are, are essentially the same as saying, you know, if you say you don't like comics, it's saying like, you don't like movies or you don't like ice cream. Like there are so many different versions of what a, what a comic is. And, and when you put a comic in front of a kid and you know, you guys know this as librarians as, as, as well as anybody does, a kid immediately latches onto it. There is no, re like kids, kids will go to a comic way before they can even like effectively read because the story, especially if the storytelling is strong or simple because the storytelling is there in, in the art. Um, so I think, I think resistance to it, if it, if it's there is because, you know, parents are concerned about their, their kids doing something they think is easier than actual legitimate reading and that will never push them over the wall into, into real reading. But everything I've ever heard and, and, you know, I've spoken to other librarians, I've spoken to teachers, everybody seems to suggest that comics are, are just another path to, to whatever you want to call it. I mean, it is reading, it's reading. And the, the idea of, of it being almost like a gateway to, to sort of big kid reading or whatever you want to say, I think is, is legitimate. I think anything that gets a book in a kid's hand and gets them used to the experience of reading and experiencing a story that way, uh, whether it has pictures or not is, is good. I mean, you know, people don't really seem to have that much of an issue with kids reading like kids picture books, which are essentially illustrations with text. Comics are basically kind of the same. So I, I think that the, the way that you used to be able to get comics, they didn't really have them in libraries growing up when I was a kid at all. Uh, you used to have to go to these like weird kind of grotty shops that were run by unusual people most of the time had kind of an unusual clientele most of the time um i know that i almost would have to like like i would go to the, my local comic shop with my older brother it was always kind of a weird experience there were always areas of the shop that were kind of roped off the good news is that experience is is while it still exists in some places it is largely gone comic shops are a a very welcoming environment for the most part and they have all kinds of books most comic shops have a have a dedicated kids section just like most libraries i would think have a dedicated graphic novel for kids section so it's all positive signs as far as i'm concerned um i'm i'm you know i'm very excited about it i think it's going to be great i think the comics readers the young comics readers of today who are growing up on on books like dogman or whatever are going to graduate to the to the more sophisticated storytelling uh in in years to come which is great for guys like Ryan and me that's a perfect segue into our next, or we worked on these questions together. So it's our next two questions, even though mm -hmm. I'm asking them. Uh, so the first one is, uh, as I mentioned earlier in our spiel, last week was Banned Books Week. The right. library is doing a year long campaign for freedom to read. Um, what would your response be if your work uh, was banned or challenged? And what advice would you give anyone in the audience today or who might look on on this recording later um for anyone who is facing challenges expressing um or getting a uh, flack or uh advice let me start over sorry what advice would you give if challenges um, are more external um 
to their work or to their process, like publishing, okay. um, right. well, editors, beta later. readers. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Ryan. I mean, I, I, have, I have some thoughts, but I just talked for a long time. So yeah, why don't you go I mean, ahead? Uh, obviously, I'd like... <clears throat> It's a it's a it's a crazy thing to try and control art and and information like that. Um, <clears throat> for me, I would go out and try and like if a book was banned or threatened to be banned, that means I would go get it and read it because that means it's cool. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, like it just we we have this really strange world right now where. Um, the way you get your information is constantly in flux and changing. Um, and so like, you know, like I came up being like a DIY person that would make my own comics. And so like nothing that I was doing had any sort of, like, I didn't have an editor. I didn't have anyone telling me not to do what I was doing. Um, and so I made a lot of comics that, you know, we're not we're not for everyone um and so and i i had this weird awakening where image comics had had put uh, a volume of god hates astronauts into something called a humble bundle mm -hmm. um which is like uh uh they just were like here's a bunch of volume ones and you can pay like 20 dollars, and you get all these volume ones for very cheap and so all these people that were not my target audience for god hates astronauts who did not like a weird irreverent um you know r-rated superhero comic uh read my book and uh boy did i hear about it it was uh it was pretty rough there was a a lot of people coming out of the woodwork to tell me not not just that they didn't like it but that it was like the worst comic they had ever read in their lives and it was <laughs> it was like an experience where i was just like yeah i didn't make it for you you weren't supposed to read it <laughs> like you wouldn't get any of the jokes <laughs> you know um and so, you know, just I've always I've always found that to be such an interesting thing, how much our culture craves hostility towards other people's art. And it's just like, just just ignore it. Like, don't like it has nothing to do with you. Like, it's not for you. And just let it be. And, you know, because there are people that like it. If there weren't, it wouldn't exist because, you know, they you know, it just wouldn't exist because you need an audience to make these things. Um so yeah, I guess those are my thoughts on it. I mean, I I agree with all of that. Uh, I think you know the the question that the, the part of the question that you asked with me that really resonated with me was what what do people who are trying to get into this field or any creative field and who find pushback um, based on the content of their work, based on their their own background, based on uh, you know the the various gatekeepers along the way. Uh, I'm I'm happy to say there are, there seem to be less in comics than in other creative fields, but you, there is always going to be somebody who's who's ready and willing to tell you no, we're we're not going to publish your work, we're not going to you know support it in whatever way, and sometimes that comes from a a cultural like banned books perspective, uh, and sometimes it comes from a commercial perspective, like we don't think this this work is ready to go, uh, we don't we don't think there's money in it there's all kinds of reasons why people will, will tell you no or try to tear your work down. And the, I, in, in some of those honestly can, can be valid, which is a crazy thing to say, but it's true, right? If there, there, when you're, when you're trying to make work that has a commercial endpoint as its goal, and sometimes you are trying to do that, you're trying to make money with your work. There are things the market says that, that can mean you need to adjust what you're doing to, to work within a commercial framework. There's always this, this sort of fight between what's called art and commerce. And so being realistic about that and being realistic about your, where you are, what you wanna do, how you wanna fit your work into that spectrum of pure art, pure commerce is, is a decision you need to be very self-aware about. And you probably don't need to do it in the earliest stages of your career, but there's a point where you should think about where you want your work to land in the, in the overall spectrum of pure art, pure commerce. It's very rare that some pure art also becomes purely commercial. Every once in a while it happens, but it's not common. Um, but that's a different thing than, than the idea that the content of your work would be something that would be pushed back against by gatekeepers. Uh, 
and and particularly because if it's if it is if it is true content right it is something that is deeply connected to you something that you feel like is is worth putting into the world because it reflects your experience or reflects experience that you think should be in the world um that you just have to kind of buckle down and 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 say i don't care what people say and i'm going to find the path and it it in my experience, there's always going to be somebody who's willing to tell you that they don't like what you've done. And there's always going to be somebody who's going to be willing to say, you're, you're not good enough. You're not worth it. Your, your work is, is not ready. It's, it's ugly. It's bad, whatever. And you have to grow kind of a thick skin, which is a tough piece of advice, uh, but it's a true piece of advice. And you just have to say, I don't care. And I'm going to keep putting it into the world. Um, and for some people, historically, it's been really like the, the the challenges that people have had to face to put their art into the world have been extraordinary. People have been killed for it. Uh, and hopefully that doesn't happen to anybody on this call. I definitely hope that doesn't happen to anybody on this call today. But but it can be really, really hard. Art is incredibly powerful. And so it can generate incredibly powerful reactions, both good and bad and and like embarking on a path of artistic truth can really, it can, it can complicate your life, but it's also one of the most beautiful things in the world. Uh, and I, I think I would, I think everybody should, should, should do some form of art, find their own truth through art, whatever that path is, um, no matter how difficult it, it might be. Uh, so I kind of went on a tangent there, but I hope that, I hope that helps answer a little bit. How, how I feel about it. No, that was perfect. We are a little bit over time, but that's fine. Yeah. Teresa's at Sorry. home. I don't have anything to do for the rest of the day, but be here with y'all. A uh, bit of a fib. But we, I do want to get to um, the question in the chat, and then we have a couple more questions. Awesome. Um, so first part of this question is, was there anything that was just too weird to make it into the final version of eight billion genies oh wow and yeah, this... i mean there, there there are things that we um we charles and i will riff on a hypotheticals that are not really like they only make us laugh and they're only references to things that we know and so yeah i mean there's there's some things that we talked about that aren't in there but there's there's tons of things that we talked about that um are not in there just because we didn't have room it's just like the format of the mm -hmm. story it was very it was especially as it goes on you know when you're doing an issue that covers 80 years and then eventually an issue that covers uh, 800 years um there's only so much you can put in there so like <clears throat> we have a t you know we have so many ideas and the more that we, you know, pitch the book and would talk about the book and have panels and meetings and stuff, we just like ideas just kept popping out of it because there are so it's such an easy starting place to like go off and, and create a narrative of pretty much any genre. Um, but in terms of like something that was like too weird, I mean, I think I put all that in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I. I was struggling at the beginning because um, so many uh, like Charles would like in the first issue, it's like uh, there's a sequence where they open the door and there's a two page spread. And then the world is just filled with wishes, like all these crazy wishes. And um, and I realized like, well, most things adults would wish for are not really visual. Like being a billionaire is not really visual. Being immortal is not a, like very visual, like being you know famous or popular like there's there's just so many things that like i can't i can't illustrate that very clearly but then i realized that oh uh children have wishes and teenagers who don't understand responsibility or the world have wishes and so they would just wish for goofy stuff and so that's when i started like filling the space with you know pretty much anything i wanted um and like sometimes i would outsource friends i'd be like all right give me some weird wishes I'd like text them while I'm drawing to fill in the background or i text charles i'm like go give me more weird ideas and then you know i just kind of riff off them so it was you know um a, a lot of that background filler is just me being like what is a thing that i want to draw what have i not drawn yet have i not drawn like a japanese kaiju have i not drawn you know a, a skeleton snake or something right so um 
yeah so i think i don't i don't know if anything got cut because it was too weird i think it's <laughs> i think it's all there <laughs> The, the the fun thing, though, is that the weirdness well never seems to dry up. We, we did a, a special secret bonus issue of Eight Billion Genies, so essentially the ninth, uh, which we're debuting this weekend at New York Comic Con. So um, which which so it didn't exist before. It's, it's very cool. It's special. It's brand new. It was like we decided to do it as like a surprise drop, uh, which is neat. Uh, and we both got back into the rhythm of Eight Billion Genies and how weird it is immediately and and this particular issue was set in new york because it's for new york comic-con and so i got to write i'm a i've been in new york for a long time almost 30 years and so i uh i know this city incredibly well and the so getting to write scenes set in central park or just different spots and, and thinking about how the genies would influence new york city was was super fun and how they like how the subway would change and just all these really neat things and so so getting to write genies the eight billion genies world through a new york lens was was super fun uh and and as i like there are very weird things in that issue are there not ryan yeah yeah there's weird stuff yeah, yeah. Real and, weird then, stuff. and then i you know i did my typical coat of paint on your weird ideas to make them yeah. even weirder so even weirder they are super weird <laughs> so we hope we hope anybody who gets their hands on that enjoys it <laughs> So kind of to follow up, I there's a question in the chat. How is the sh- eight uh eight billion GDs show coming? Are you allowed to talk about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um we so so the rights to eight billion genies, the adaptation rights, the Hollywood big fancy Hollywood adaptation rights were um we uh licensed them to Amazon Studios last year, I think. And mm-hmm. they have been working on developing it actually as a film. Uh, film and connected universe of things. So like film, TV show, animated, whatever. And uh, they were working very hard on it. We were in close communication with them. We were very excited about everything they were saying. And then the writer's strike happened uh, and the actor strike happened, both very necessary. I am a member of the Writers Guild and completely support everything that happened there. Uh, But it did mean that development was paused. So uh, the writer's strike has ended, which is wonderful. We just ratified the the new deal um, this week. And the hopefully the after strike will finish up soon, the SAG after strike. And at that point, we're expecting development to just sort of, you know, get rolling again in a, in a serious way. So we know they're really behind it. Uh, they seem really excited about all those possibilities we've been talking about, about how you can tell this story in so many different ways and so many different flavors. Uh, so as far as we know, uh, you will you will see it at some point soon. Uh, and believe me, we we want that too, because it would be great for us. It would be great for the book uh, and just great for genies. Everybody needs more genies. <laughs> okay, I think for the essence of time, we have space for one more question. And maybe two. <laughs> um, so it's near Comic-Con. Uh, we've asked everyone this question, but... Where can, uh, if you're attending, I know, mm-hmm. Charles, you're already here, kind of, if, but mm-hmm. where can fans find you? Uh, uh, what are you doing? Are you doing other panels, uh, giving away things? And what are you looking um, most forward to at your time here? Ryan? Yeah. Um, so Charles and I are in Artist Alley at table G39 and G40. We're next to each right other. Right next to each other. It's like this, except in real life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, we, you know, the big thing for the show is that, um, well, one is the first big comic show that Charles and I have done since the 8 Billion Genies oversized hardcover has been released. Um, so we will have those at our table, which um, are really fun for me to draw in. Uh, and I and I love, you know, I love selling those to people. So that, that'll be really, really fun. I'm looking forward to that. And then, as Charles said, we did a brand new issue that takes place that is uh, in the 8 Billion Genies universe that is not in that hardcover. And it's something, you know, we did a small print run. We're just self-releasing it. Um, we thought it'd be really fun to have some nice treat for the fans. You know, mm-hmm. it was done entirely in secret. And then we just announced it this week. So um, we're hoping that that will uh, get a lot of people to come and say hi and get books signed and uh, all that fun stuff. Um, so yeah, very, very big on, on the secret 8 billion genies drop. Uh, I, I, I have a, a, a writing career that is absurd. Like I, 
you know, remember when Ryan mentioned the whole workaholic thing? That is not, he's not making that up. Like we are both like insanely prolific in our careers. And so I actually have six, six different things releasing this week, including the, the 8 Billion Genies issue. So I work on a lot of different comics. I work on a lot of different things. Uh, but, but one of the things that I'm super excited about that just, just came out yesterday is a, is a kid's picture book called Jedi Brave in Every Way, which I wrote. Um, it's about, you know, Yoda teaching some like baby Jedi how to not be afraid of things. Uh, because the, the baby Jedi, like somebody tells the baby Jedi, like, this is what you're going to have to do when you were grown up Jedi. And they're like, wait a minute, what? We have to do what? And so Yoda's like, no, no, it's cool. It's cool. It'll be great. And so Yoda teaches them some things. But the thing that I'm particularly excited about that book is that I wrote it with my daughter, my 17 year old daughter, Rosemary. And so we we were able to to tell a Star Wars story together and it's beautifully illustrated by Valerie Valdivia. Um, I hope it lands in every library in the land. Um, and, and so that just uh, that just hit stores yesterday and, and she's going to come to the Comic-Con on Friday to do a signing there at the show specifically with, with me. So uh, that I'm really, really I would even say I'm, I'm arguably more excited about that than I am about hanging out with Ryan. But it's a close it's a close call. It's a close call. <laughs> oh, that, that Tabij and I will try and make an effort because I—that's so cute and yeah. love father daughter time. It's always yeah. precious. Mm -hmm. Um, I, so that's it for our questions. We do have a little bit more of a spiel at the end, uh, but we want to thank um everyone who attended. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Charles and Ryan, uh, tossing it back to you, Teresa. Okay. So I'm getting my notes back up. Okay. So yes, thank you to Charles and Ryan. This was such a great conversation and thank you to all of our guests. Like Whitney said, this has been recorded and we will be sending out the recording once it's uploaded to our website and we'll be sending it to everyone so they can watch and rewatch this amazing, amazing conversation. Please take the time to check out the books that um, by Charles and Ryan separately and together that we have available in our collection. We have curse words, undiscovered country we just um god hates astronauts and also the newly released book eight billion genies so all of these books are available in our um, um at, available at branch locations in either both digital and in print format and if you are looking for more comics Please take, uh, just like um, we were talking about, tomorrow is the start of New York Comic Con. And if you are an educator, um, Pro Day is tomorrow, and so only on Thursday. And the New York Public Library is offering CTLE credit. And also, great, um, there are other great panel discussions that are happening at the Javits Center. So please take the time to take a look at, um, to see what is being offered. And also, we just love Image Comics. That's why we do this great core, um, every like season um, book buzz. And we're having um, the fall book buzz by the amazing Chloe Ramos, the library sales manager at Image, Image, Com Image Comics. And she will be giving out the books that are going to be up and coming for the fall season. So that will be happening in on November 2nd. And we just put the registration link for that in the chat. So make sure to, um, to be aware of that. So Charles, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to um, join us this morning. And thank you for everyone taking the time to join us. Please take the time to follow Pelham Parkway Van Ness and 53rd Street on social media. Um, we're on available at on Facebook and on Instagram. And also take the time to follow Ryan and Charles on social media and this was just an amazing series of talks, like we said, that we're going to be, we're going to upload them to the site and make sure to share them to all attendees. So thank you again. And we hope everyone have, has a safe and fun New York Comic Con. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank Take care. Bye-bye. Yep.
Take Thanks. care. Bye. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,